and we seek to play a role in providing guidance on what advocacy can and should entail, but also in organizing and connecting advocacy efforts. Like I said earlier, recognizing that the INEE membership and constituency has you know, many different players and actors who are working in you know, different um, parts of the world and also facing conflicts that take uh, you know, different shapes and forms. So our role is really to try and connect uh, those different efforts and to be more of a connector and a convener in that space. Next slide, please. Um, so on that slide, it just gives you an idea. Uh, we, are very, we are a fairly small group, uh, small but well coordinated. And you know, there's a list there of some of the organizations who make up this um, advocacy working group. Um, and at the moment, uh, the group is uh, co-chaired by Care USA, as well as by Development Alternatives Inc., which is DAI but also includes other organizations such as, um, you know, Plan International UK, the Xavier Project, Save the Children International, um, and the others that are on the list there. Next slide, please. Um, so I've included on that slide, uh, you know, just a summary of our objectives. Uh, firstly, to promote the right to education for learners affected by conflict and crisis. Um, as I said before, many of you are working in many different parts of the world where you are facing, you know, different challenges and different crises and, you know, working in different ways using different approaches. And so our role as a, you know, advocacy working group is to really promote the right of education for learners who find themselves in these contexts. Um, secondly, it's also to underscore the importance of bridging the divide between, you know, the humanitarian as well as the development work um, in the education sector. Uh, thirdly, we seek to amplify the voices of the INEE network members, both individually and collectively on um, education in emergencies. So we really hope that we can be a catalyst for some, you know, cross-learning and some, um, you know, creating new connections between different organizations, particularly in relation to um, different advocacy efforts that you may be involved in. And then lastly, to assist uh, INEE and its membership to be thought leaders and conveners um, in education and uh, in emergency. Next slide, Gustavo. Um, as a working group, we had our first face-to-face uh, first -face, uh, meeting in Oslo in May. Uh, when I say first, I mean within this current mandate of 2018 to 2020. And um, at that meeting, we worked together to come up with a work plan. And since then, we've been really working hard to refine and to really shape our work. And we've distilled that into uh, four work streams. Um, the first work stream is looking at um, INEE minimum standards. Uh, some of you may be familiar with them. Some of you may not. But feel free again to visit the INEE website, uh, which will provide, you know, you know, both the standards themselves, but also more information about um, how those standards can be used. So our first work stream is looking at uh, INEE minimum standards and the, you know, sustainable development goal number four and trying to explore some collaborative work in order to really promote the continued use of the standards and other tools as a prerequisite to the achievement of um, sustainable development goal number four. So this is you know, work that we are currently doing and currently developing and shaping. And uh, we may you know, call upon some of you, in, you know, as we shape and um, develop that work uh, further. The second work stream is the capacity development in advocacy for education in emergencies, what we are calling CAPDEV. And um, this particular work stream came about as we recognize that we do have the you know, potential to 
provide uh, capacity for different, recognizing that organizations may have uh, dif different levels of cap uh, advocacy capacity and what role that we as the advocacy working group can provide to the membership in order to strengthen that capacity. And that can go in different directions. Um, for example, us providing uh, uh, advocacy capacity in the form of webinars such as the one we're running uh, at the moment, but also maybe providing opportunities for uh, the membership to also share different learning and experiences uh, through the platforms that we uh, will create. And so under that work stream, we are really aiming to design and promote the use of um, an education in emergencies advocacy toolkit, but also to build the capacity of INEE members as well as other actors. Um, the third work stream is looking at elevating voices. Um, and under this work stream, we felt that it's important to ensure that we have the voices of both Northern INGOs, but also Southern INGOs um, contributing to the conversation around advocacy for education in emergencies. And so we are really working hard under this work stream to invest in a deliberate and consistent concerted effort to reach less powerful voices in the work of INEE, the advocacy working group itself, and um, education in emergencies more broadly. And then lastly, the work stream on child protection. Uh, this is the work stream where we will be, you know, collaborating and working together with different partners, including um, actors such as uh, the Child Protection Alliance. Next slide, please. And so coming back to this webinar, um, as my colleagues have already alluded to, this is the first um, of in a series of webinars that we hope uh, to host in the future. And so the objectives of this particular one was firstly really to launch the advocacy working group as a platform for building the advocacy capacity of the INEE membership or constituency. In other words, making sure that the constituents is aware of this of the working group and the opportunities that exist in the various platforms um, that we can set up including this webinar uh, and secondly we want to use this as a way of uh, presenting what we're calling the advocacy 101 essentially with a view to ignite a conversation around advocacy but also uh, as our third objective there to solicit feedback from you on potential capacity gaps in relation to advocacy, but also maybe future support needs and opportunities for engagement in relation to advocacy. In other words, we are hoping that in future webinars, we can have um, more of the membership also coming in to present and sharing, um, you know, your experiences and, you know, uh, uh, results coming out of the advocacy work that you're doing as part of cross-learning um, and also uh, sharing of different experiences. And so at this moment, I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Alison, who's going to take us through um, a presentation on, on advocacy for education in emergencies at different levels. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ellen. Um, I'm going to assume that people can hear me unless I see otherwise in the chat box. So if my audio is cutting out at any point, then, then somebody please let me know um, and I will, uh, I'll try to address that. Um, so I'm um, going to be speaking to that second objective. Ellen has already spoken more to the, uh, the role and the, uh, the mandate and objectives of the advocacy working group. Um, I'm going to be trying to address that that second point about um, the advocacy 101, which is uh, which is I think quite um, going really kind of going back to basics. And my presentation is going to be talking about the um, sort of the what and the how of, um, or rather the what and the what and the why of, uh, of um, advocacy for education and emergencies. Um, so as, uh, as, as Edmund introduced me, I'm the Humanitarian Policy and Advocacy Advisor at Plan International Headquarters. Um, I'm going to try and talk um, in quite general terms about uh, EIE advocacy, 
Um, but but I will try. I, I will be illustrating um, where where relevant and where I can with examples from uh, from the work that we're doing at, at Plan. Um, just to give a, a bit of background, because because I know that you know all, many of the organisations and people on this call are from from different types of organisations. Plan International is a is an international uh, NGO. We we work across development and humanitarian settings. Um, we we have we've, we've scaled up our education and emergencies responses and currently have. Um, education emergencies as part of uh, responses in a, about 25 of our responses, um, and we reach about half a million children currently. Um, so advocacy, as uh, in general, as part of education emergencies, is is focused on ensuring safe, quality, and inclusive education. But Plan, in particular, has a focus on gender responsive education and particularly addressing the the needs and uh, and barriers faced by girls um, so that will come through a little bit in my my presentation um, we also work at all levels so although we're an ingo we work at uh, we we we, uh, we we advocate at um at community and uh, and within responses uh, but also national policy and and up to the international level so i'll try to kind of capture that and reflect that in my presentation um okay so we go to the next slide please gustavo Thank you. Okay, so so the first question, very very basic one, what is what is advocacy? What are we actually talking about? Um, now there was there is a sort of a, a standard definition, I suppose, but what I've included on this slide, and I'm not going to read them all out, um, are three definitions from different organisations. They're all organisations which are part of the uh, INE Advocacy Working Group. Um, all organisations, all of these organisations work across development and humanitarian settings, so they're not specific to um, to education or education emergencies. Um, but I wanted to sort of draw out some of the, the common um, uh, the commonalities between different understandings of, of advocacy to illustrate what we're really talking about. Um, so the first point to highlight, and next slide please, Gustavo. So the first point to note is that what we're talking about here is a, a deliberate, systematic approach or, or process. So all of the all of these definitions talk about a deliberate process, a set of organized activities, a systematic and targeted set of actions. So we're talking about uh, we're talking about advocacy as a as a as a process, as a planned and deliberate and um, uh, and and uh, sort kind of systematic um, intentional process. We're not really talking here about kind of one-off ad hoc activities, although a, a, an advocacy strategy and, a, and, and a, 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 an advocacy process may and should be able to take advantage of unforeseen opportunities and changes in context um, and, and be able to adapt accordingly. But overall, we're talking about a, a systematic and planned process. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the second and a feature of these uh, these definitions is about what the um, what this process of advocacy is aiming to achieve. So all of these definitions talk about influence. They all talk about um, all refer to, uh, to to policies. Um, others refer, some of them refer to uh, institutional policies and practice. Um, resource allocation legislation. But they're they're talking about they're all referring to um, advocacy primarily directed at achieving policy change and a more in, within a more kind of formal space. Now we understand that advocacy is sometimes used to refer to perhaps more informal, uh, uh, perhaps goes more kind of behavior change, um, attitudinal change. We're talking more in the domain of kind of formal, um, uh, of, uh, within a sort of a formal institutional um, changes primarily. Um, I'll, we, that's something perhaps we could have a discussion about, but that's, that's primarily what these um, if, if everyone could mute their microphones, that would make my job e presenting easier so I don't have feedback in my ears. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the, the third kind of characteristic of these, um, these or, or feature of these definitions is about what advocacy is trying to achieve. Um, and, and each of these, as they come from different agencies, sort of speak to their own organizational focus or organizational mandate. Um, so whether that's to reduce poverty, achieve social justice, the second two talk more about change for children's lives, uh, changes in children's lives, um, or, or um, action which will protect, protect and respect, protect and fulfill children's rights. So, so different, different organizations have, might have a focus on different uh, on, on different purposes. Um, la, uh, next slide, please. 
the final point to note before we move on is is more about the sort of the how is um, uh, how as advocates we work. Now, th these are all from organisations and all actually international organisations which work as, as advocates and often have a, have a platform to be speaking um, on issues of, on behalf of um, affected communities, um, often affected by humanitarian uh, disasters or crises. Um, but the, the, the fact that we, are, we often have, as, as advocates, we often have this platform means that we need to look at how we are positioned to, um, to, to represent and to speak on behalf of those people most affected by crises. Um, so the second two definitions particularly highlight that in terms of um, speaking on behalf of um, and how we um, and, and, and speaking alongside um, affected communities and particularly children. Um, at Plan, we take that um, that kind of that, the, the platform that we have and the responsibility we have very seriously, um, and, and make sure that we are um, that, that where, wherever we can in our, our advocacy, we are reflecting and including the voices of the people affected, particularly children and young people. So that might involve doing things like activities like children's consultations um, or youth consultations. It might involve supporting um, young youth activists and, uh, and advocates to speak on behalf of issues um, that affect them. Okay, moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So the next area that I'm gonna talk about is more about why we do um, EIE advocacy. Um, so I, I, you know, we, we could take this as in terms of kind of why we do advocacy more generally, but, if, but the focus here is on, um, on EIE. So, the, so really advocacy is kind of one strategy um, or one tool that we have to, um, to, to meet our goals in, uh, in whatever form they may take. Um, well, one, one perhaps sort of set of tools that we, that, that we have. And we use that alongside, obviously, direct programming, but also communications uh, um, and, and media, um, partnerships, research, and so on and so forth. But, what, so, but what, it is, what is it about advocacy which, which can help us to achieve our, um, some of our CIE goals? Um, so the third, perhaps most, most sort of obvious answer to that, and this list on the slide is not exhaustive, it's a, su a set, of, um, set of kind of suggestions that I came up with. Um, uh, the first point is about increasing the reach and sustainability of impact. Um, so obviously a change in, in government policy um, or practice or by, by governments or, or other actors can affect many more people than, the, than an agency's programmes alone. So a, an example um, example of this, for example, might be a, you know, a, a disaster risk reduction project in a, at a community level um, may reach a community or a, or a, um, a, a small area, but, but um, advocating for that change, um, change to um, disaster legislation and, uh, and practice and policy within the education sector may make a, they um, kind of roll that out and, um, and, and scale those models across, the, uh, across a much wider area and, and, and even across, across the, the, the whole country. Um, the second point about holding duty bearers accountable for their responsibility to fulfill all children's right to education in humanitarian contexts, um, and that's very much speaking to the, the kind of the right-based approach um, and the, the use of, of international um, framework, uh, uh, international um, uh, legal and policy frameworks uh, and legal and policy and, and commitment to uh, to hold duty bearers and particularly governments accountable for their um, uh, accountable for their their commitments. Um, this is very much within the uh, the INEE minimum standards that uh, that Alan mentioned. Um, is this the the rights based approach and, and and primarily upholding children's right to an education in all contexts is is embedded within that. Um, so this might, for example, involve um, making sure that uh, advocating for uh, refugee children to be educated within a national education system. It might mean uh, uh, upholding, um, you know, commitments to protect education from attack, for example. Um, uh, the third point is about um, uh, ensuring that education is prioritised within the humanitarian response and ensuring ad uh, adequate resources are made available. I'll come on to this more in the next slide, but that's very much ensuring that that um, education is able to continue because there is adequate prioritisation and there is funds, there's funds available. There's been a lot of work, particularly you know, a lot of the work of, of INEE in, in advocating for education cannot wait is about raising the profile of, of education and the need to fund it appropriately. Um, and finally, coming back to the point that I was making before, is about ensuring that the voices and priorities of those affected by crises, including children, are heard by and can help influence decision makers. Um, 
so very much using our platform as advocates to, to raise and amplify the voices of people affected and, and make sure their priorities are heard by, by those taking decisions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how can EIE, uh, how can advocacy contribute to, to EIE goals? So I'm, I'm going to run through some, some examples, and I have sort of alluded to some examples already, but run through some examples at different levels um, of how, um, how advocacy can contribute to, uh, to our EIE goals. Um, so, so that can relate to different levels. It can obviously concern it as, as our education and emergencies work covers a, a broad range of topics. Um, I'll, I'll sort of put, pull some a, a range of examples that, that by no means exhaustive, and involve a range of tactics and mediums. Um, we uh, we're going to get less into that last one. That's perhaps a topic for a future um, future webinar on the actual sort of how of how we actually go about doing advocacy. Uh, but I'll give some, in the, the, the remainder of the presentation, I'll give some examples of um, advocacy at different levels and, and uh, on a range of different topics. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so during an emergency response. Um, and the first point to note that, that during an emergency response where, where education, the education cluster is activated at national level, um, then that, that is a key forum for... Oh, there's some, some background noise from somebody. Um, that's a key forum for um, for, for conducting uh, advocacy within the uh, within the humanitarian coordination architecture, and that's both sort of um, to, um, to making making sure that there is uh, that the, the response is of a, is well coordinated and is sufficient uh, quality and is accountable, but also making sure that education is is prioritised. Um, Obviously, within a within a refugee response, the, the the clusters may not be activated, but there will be other coordination mechanisms. So, that that it is it's important that within a response that that advocacy where possible is coordinated. Um, it, it may focus on, for example, as I mentioned previously, securing funding, uh, prioritisation of uh, of education within emergency appeals, improving the quality and accountability of the uh, the education response. For example, making sure that the IME minimum standards are um, are used by by all actors in the response. Um, but but more broadly, perhaps there is often that during a during a response or during a crisis, there is a often a window of opportunity to advocate for policy change. For example, for um, enacting disaster response legislation um, to to be um, sort of taking advantage of the opportunity to kind of build back better, perhaps after a after a natural disaster, a, um, a, an earthquake, or a, um, or a very destructive um, climatic event, uh, there might be an opportunity to, for example, strengthen school safety. For example, um, uh, so that may, that may be an objective of, of advocacy. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so at national level advocacy. So of course these, these are not um, uh, these are not uh, mutually exclusive, um, so, but uh, this is sort of obviously can be happening at the same time as that more sort of response focused uh, level advocacy. Um, but examples of where um, advocacy may target government policies, practice, budgets, resource allocation um, may be about securing and implementing government commitments to protect education from attack, for example, upholding commitments made to, for example, the Safe Schools Declaration, um, integrating disaster risk reduction, preparedness and response in education sector policies, plans and budgets. Um, it may involve, for example, the inclusion of refugees in national education systems. Um, and, and more broadly, the, as the fulfilment of government's international commitments. So this, the, these inter, this international level, which I'll come to in a second, these, these kind of commitments to um, human rights frameworks, international humanitarian law, um, other sort of uh, other, other kind of endorsement of other commitments, provide a useful framing for, uh, for, for advocacy at national level to ensure that governments are actually acting on and upholding, upholding those commitments. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so before moving on to the uh, the, the, uh, the international level, the, often there is the opportunity to do advocacy um, with donors, both both in and uh, and external to the country, um, and that might involve, for example, influencing donor policies, frameworks, and priorities around uh, around how they prioritise education, um, what they prioritise, how they're um, how they're sort of framing and focusing on uh, on education emergencies within their funding frameworks and policies. Um, 
uh, within the context of specific crises, making sure that, that, that funding is secured and influencing priorities, so using evidence from, uh, from our emergency responses to, to shape and influence um, uh, donor priorities. Um, again, holding donors accountable for international commitments they've made perhaps at pledging, pledging events, um, and uh, urging donors to act as, as advocates for, for education and emergencies. Uh, final slide, please. Okay, and the, the finally at the global or, or international level, um, there is there's much work to be done on this this uh, kind of international global legal policy frameworks, and that might involve, for example, work at the the Human Rights Council, UN Security Council, um, UN General Assembly resolutions all provide the sort of the, the, the legal and normative framing for much of the advocacy that um, that, that happens at, at national level. Um, it might involve shaping and engaging in global funding mechanisms. Key ones, obviously, for EIE include um, Education Cannot Wait, but also um, uh, global funding mechanisms like uh, GPE, Global Partnership for Education. Um, uh, the, using the, the, using the, the uh, international reporting mechanisms and accountability mechanisms, uh, such as children affected by armed conflict, um, uh, shaping and inf influencing agendas in international fora, for example, the, uh, the G7 and G20 agendas, which um, often kind of have, a, have, have had an, an education focus. Um, and securing high-level commitments. Um, there's work, obviously, underway to, uh, to, to secure commitments to the, uh, the Safe Schools Declaration, um, funding commitments to these uh, international financial, uh, financing instruments like Education Cannot Wait. So, uh, so that, that advocacy at that level can, uh, can help to secure um, funding for those, uh, those sorts of instruments. So that's, um, I think that's the last slide from me. Just flick to the next slide just to check. <laughs> there's nothing left. Yes. Okay. That's that's all from me. So that was that's that was a, that was my very quick run through of uh, of the advocacy 101, um, covering what what we understand by advocacy and some examples of where it can be useful. Um, as I said, I didn't really get into the the, the tactics or um, or much of the the kind of the how of how we do advocacy, um, but very interested to see the, the the questions and to to have a bit of a discussion. I haven't been looking at the chat box, so I will have a look at that now. Um, but thank you all. I'll hand back to Edmund. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Alison and Ellen, for the for great presentation. Um, I think it was a really good introduction to what could be a um, very enriching um, set of webinars that could go into a lot more detail. And that's what we want to, to start discussing now in this next section. Um, we have four potential discussion questions. We don't have to cover them all, and we also have a chance for participants to ask questions about um, some of the things that you said so far. So in the questions that we have, starting with the first one, which advocacy topics would interest you for coverage in future webinars? Um, as an example, Alison mentioned that um, she didn't have a chance today to talk much about the range of tactics and mediums that can be employed in um, strategies for advocacy, and possibly that could be an area that we could go into a bit more detail in the future. Then, would you be interested in presenting your organization's work? What are your organization's advocacy priorities and how can the advocacy working group help you further this work? And do you have any advocacy materials or resources which may be useful in, to this constituency? Now, these are all um, some possible discussion questions for today. Um, we'd be very interested to hear feedback from the participants. It's great um, that we've got a good turnout today, currently 44 participants. Um, we also have a bit of time scheduled left, so I think there's a high chance that most people who have feedback or inputs will be able to do so. On this setting of WebEx, there's currently not the option for, for raising your hand, so what we'd request, uh, if you have something that you'd like to say, if you could, in the chat box, you can choose to either enter your whole question for one of the presenters to look at in text format, or 
what is um, equally good would be just to say, I have a question so that you can ask it verbally. If you are not able to use the chat box at all, in around 10, 15 minutes, we'll have a, 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 a couple of um, minutes where we'll just open the floor for people to pitch in verbally um, if they don't have a chat box. And um, you'll be able to ask your question then. So if I could ask you to, um, to, to start typing in the chat box if you, if you have a question, um, and then we'll we'll take it in order um, through the group so that people can get their chance to do so. Um, we already have a question from Catherine Adams, and we might as well start off there. Um, Catherine was saying that she might have to leave to, to attend another meeting, but I'm glad to see the whole duty bearers accountable piece. Too often we see nodding heads and tear-filled eyes on the floor of the UN, and yet on the ground in the field those motions of support don't always transfer into action. How will the INEE advocacy group work towards this goal? And how can we help work towards this goal? So possibly that could be a question we could start off for Alison, either you or Ellen, um, to start with. Okay, so there's a silence. I'll start speaking, <laughs> although I'm, I'm not sure I'm necessarily best placed to uh, uh, to speak on behalf of the the um, INE advocacy working group, um, as I'm not a, another, although I'm a member, I'm neither a co-chair nor the coordinator. Um, uh, but, but more generally, um, I think that the point of uh, so I'm just looking at the uh, the question how the the point about um, holding duty bearers accountable. I mean, I think. Uh, a key part of um, of how sort of individual agencies or groups of agencies can um, uh, can can sort of uh, can help to, to hold duty bearers accountable. Firstly, is to, is to kind of to use those use the um, the frameworks and international commitments, um, the human rights, uh, international human rights, international humanitarian law, uh, international refugee law, as as tools that they can use within their advocacy. So very much kind of frame asks around um, uh, frame asks around those uh, um, those 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 commitments that uh, that um, uh, the governments have made. Um, so so I think the the way that we see it is um, is about. Um, uh, is, is about using it as a, as a framing and include and making sure that that's a cornerstone of, uh, of, of any analysis. Um, part of it is, is making sure that, that rights holders, um, uh, children and communities understand the rights that they have and can support them to, to advocate um, advocate on their own behalf and, and hold their own duty bearers accountable. Often we are, you know, we are not within the country we're not um you know we're not citizens and therefore not not um uh, not the rights holders themselves but to to support that process um but uh, but but externally as well using using other uh, reporting and accountability mechanisms to to hold duty bearers accountable whether that is through the, the human rights council obviously there are there are issues around that but but have played have played a, uh, an important role in in highlighting human rights violations and calling for concrete action on on specific human rights violations, um, engaging in, uh, in in international processes to to sort of nudge the nudge the conversation towards a stronger rights based approach. Um, I think are, are some of the ways that, that that we should be thinking about that. But in terms of the the INE advocacy working group, I mean, others may have a <laughs> may have a, a more robust answer to that question. Hey, um, this is Gustavo Payan. Um, I'm, I'm happy to serve. I, I work with DAI, and I'm happy to serve with Ellen as, as a co-chair of the advocacy working group. Um, I, I would I would just briefly say that I mean I think that's something that we're keeping in mind. Not exactly in response to Catherine's question, uh, which I'm, I'm going to repeat, um, just that so we all know what we're talking about. Um, uh, I am glad to see the whole duty bearers accountable piece. Too often we see nodding heads and tear filled eyes on the floor of the UN, and yet on the ground in the field, those motions of support don't always transfer into action. How will the INE advocacy working group work towards this goal? How can we help work toward this goal? Uh, so th thanks for the question, Catherine. 
Um, I would say from the perspective of the advocacy working group, one of the things that are uh, a priority for us this, this year, um, Ellen mentioned that we sort of became a, uh, this working group um, in, in, in a meeting in May in Oslo. Um, and so we'll be working for a couple of years as a team and we appreciate all, all the help that we can get. For one of our priorities for in, in our work plan for these two years is to bring bring more voices from, from the field. Um, and, and I think that's a great way to influence um, IME's agenda, uh, the advocacy working group agenda, and, and have a wider representation, making sure that then uh, those voices from the field and are, are better represented and, and hopefully that will contribute to translating more discussions in, on the, you know, from the UN floor in, in, into action in the field. It's a, it's a long process. This is what advocacy really is. is you know, it takes time, uh, but it is having a seat at the table. And that's where what, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is have a seat at the table. Part of, these, part of the objectives of this advocacy webinar and, and subsequent activities um, building advocacy is, is exactly that, is to make sure that at the end of the day, um, any discussion that happens sort of at the high level or the UN floor or in Geneva or in New York, uh, translate into action. Um, it's tricky and there's a lot of moving pieces, but unless we have more representation from the ground and, and, and from the field, then few things will change. So I will say, you know, in response to her, um, to Catherine's second question, how can we help work, work toward this goal is to be active. Um, and, and there's many platforms. IE aims to be the, the one of the main platforms um, related to education emergencies. Uh, there's many ways in which people can participate and contribute uh, from writing uh, to join, you know, uh, organizing global meetups, uh, to applying to be a working group member, um, raising the quality of your applications um, when, when you want to be a working group member. Um, that's important, making sure that you're um, targeting and, and, and you're being strategic in, in your application and you say why. We have, this, in this occasion, we have, I think, more voices from, from the field in, in our working groups, but we need more. Um, and so I, I'm going to stop there, but uh, you know that's just part of the part of the part of the answer. I don't think we necessarily have one um, one straight uh, forward answer. Um, I don't know if others. I think Peter, you wanted to to chip in. Yes, I'll, I'll try to uh, see if my microphone works this time. Um, just uh, just to say uh, uh, a little more here. I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, the advocacy working group and the INE are, are networks. So, you know, we, we were, for example, last week uh, uh, in New York for the UNGA. We were there. We talked to a lot of people. Uh, but, but, and we do kind of, and that is advocacy. So being at the UN is advocacy. But, but, but because we're a network, we need all those um, uh, voices and we need to connect all those voices. And, and that's, that's why we are a network, and that, that's why all of you, your organizations, are actually the ones that, in a sense, do the work. You know, we, as INE, don't often go out and have a strong opinion on something. Uh, we try to stay neutral. Also, the advocacy working group, we try to somewhat coordinate our members, and they are, you know, very strong members. Uh, but, but we, as a, as a group or as a network, don't always uh, be very local. So, so that's important to remember. We are, we are what our members uh, make of us and, and they make us, make us do. And so, so it's, a, it's a vehicle also for you guys. So that's important to remember. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I think um, what you and Gustavo are also suggesting is that we're we're very interested in what other people's priorities are, other organizations' advocacy priorities are. I would encourage or welcome any of you participating in this call to, to maybe ask a question about that or give a comment. And in fact, we have one um, from, from Samson uh, in Zimbabwe from the iGate project talking about corporal punishment in the, in the chat section here. 
I'm just going to summarize the question um, that in schools, corporal punishment is, is being used widely um, as, a, as a way of instilling discipline, despite the existence of policies against corporal punishment. Um, in other words, that some of the methods are, are not currently working, and Samson was asking about methods that, to lobby the gatekeepers and policy makers against the use of corporal punishment. And any experiences from others on that would be very useful. So um, anyone can comment on that would, would be good. Uh, well, uh, this is Peter here again. Uh, while others think of good answers, I, I would just like to go back to some of the stuff that Alison talked about around the uh, around the international human rights frameworks, because of course the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is very clear that corporal punishment is uh, a violation of the best interest of the child and the dignity of the child, and, and, and all countries in the world have signed up to the CRC. So we all know of course that that, that um, doesn't necessarily mean some, something, but it gives us an enormously powerful tool that we can use in advocacy going to what you call and the, the, the gatekeepers or the policymakers, and, and, and say this is actually something that you, as a government, as a state, a nation, have, have signed up to. And there, you know, there's lots of case law there, uh, hard law or, or soft law, and lots of precedents of how to deal with that and how to use the international human rights framework and the regional frameworks, whether they are American, Europeans, um, uh, African regional human rights frameworks, and how that is directly often uh, um, reflected in national legislations. Uh, so, so it's a, so uh, advocacy here needs to go hand in hand with the capacity building aspect of of people learning how to use the law, how to use the spirit of the law, and how to use the instruments of the law at different levels, so that. A case such as this one, the corporal punishment, which is very clearly uh, uh, contrary to, to the, both the spirit and, and, and the essence of, of, of the Child's Rights Convention, can be you know can be spotlighted on and hopefully eradicated. So 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 again, using the international and regional and national human rights mechanisms. Can I just, this is Alison again, can I just jump in with an additional point um, on top of what Peter said? I mean, I think that, that example, this is not something that I, I can add to in terms of the, the details of that, that particular issue, but I think that that, show, that sort of illustrates the point about advocacy being one tool to use alongside others. So I, the, the, um, in that example that was shared, um, that it, it said that, the, uh, that it's already, um, Sorry, I was looking back through the. I think I think it said in the, in the question. If I can <laughs> go back through the details of it, that it, it's already essentially saying that um, that, it, that that corporal punishment is 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 not allowed. Um, that it's against the law. Um, so so at that level, the the the, the sort of the fight is won. Um, but then there is the question of, as as Peter said, the actual implementation, translation of that policy into practice, which it is still partly um, partly a, a role of uh, role for advocacy. But but that's where advocacy needs to sit with sit alongside and act in in concert with other strategies and that might be kind of work on uh, community level school level behavior change norm change around um, around discipline and, uh, and punishment and uh, you know and, and classroom culture and so on um, that, that you know advocacy can only go so far it is an is a, is a really important tool but that's almost the case where it sounds like the, the you know the advocacy chair the advocacy for for formal policy change is, has been kind of achieved um, but it is now about the implementation which is is often more complex actually once that that um, you know the formal policy is in place it's, it's about making sure that it is it's resourced it's adopted and and, and all of that that um, all of those kind of dimensions. So the fight isn't won just because it's um, the, the policies in place. And apologies if I if I misread that and there isn't a, <laughs> there isn't a law in place because um, uh, because I, I'm, I'm now looking back through the, the details of uh, details of the question. Um, uh, but yeah, that just to just sort of see advocacy as, as one tool, one set of tools alongside other other strategies. Thank you, Alison. Um, we have questions from sixteen and KTJ that are a bit similar. Um, Christine asking whether 
INE's advocacy includes higher education, and KTJ is talking about whether our work we do in advocacy covers early learning. I can answer that um, quickly by saying yes. Um, we have a very broad definition of education in emergencies, and in fact, um, I think what's sometimes important is to think about advocating for areas of education that might not always be considered um, as, the, as the first example or idea of what, what education is, especially in an emergency context. Um, we, we also have, uh, KTJ's question goes on to say, additionally, how do we advocate to go beyond the minimal standards of child-friendly spaces? So I'll open that up to other members of the group. Uh, perhaps I can I can just start off uh, uh, and attempt an answer to this question while others uh, think also. And please, uh, it would be fantastic if others would like to join in in the answers as well, not just necessarily the people from the advocacy working group, but anyone could could I guess join in. But anyway, just a, a trying to answer that question around the minimum standards. Um, Minimum standards are not necessarily minimum. You know, we have the, the handbook on, on minimum standards for education in emergencies. Uh, it was it was written first in 2004 and then rewritten in uh, 2010. Uh, and the thing, sometimes uh, the Achilles heel of, of that booklet, uh, although it's very good, is that we call it minimum standards. They are not necessarily minimum. They're based on human rights and the human rights standards that, as we alluded to before, everyone has signed up to, because of course we cannot advocate for something that's beyond, below uh, uh, the human rights standards that everyone has the right and are entitled to. So, so in a way, the, those standards that are reflected in the minimum standards, as well as many of the other tools that we have are, uh, in INE &E and which have been developed through a very consultative and participatory process through over many years. We have a conflict sensitive education pack. We have a brand new uh, uh, psychosocial uh, uh, guidance note. Uh, many things that you can see on the, on the website. These, these don't actually advocate for a minimum standard. Often they are a maximum standard. People will also say when they are confronted with these minimum standards, gee, these we can never you know, implement. They are far too high to implement in an emergency or conflict setting or in an immediate response. And, and, uh, and sometimes, as was alluded to before, they actually will help build back better, you know, because many countries have, when they're not in emergency or before or after, uh, education systems that are below the standard that is advocated for in these minimum standards. So, so, so it can be a little problematic to focus on the minimum part of those standards, but see them as maximum standards or just as they should be, as the right to education uh, translated into emergency settings, whether it's preparedness, response, or recovery. So I will leave it there. Perhaps others more to see. Well, uh, while other people are thinking of responses to that, I would like to invite um, Cecilia Maynet, if if it's possible for you to uh, ask your question verbally. Um, got a question about resources available for advocacy, particularly in the humanitarian response. I think it would be could be great if you could explain your question potentially in a bit more detail, um, or give other insights that you already have on it, if that's possible. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but it's very faint. If you could speak a bit closer to the microphone. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, so my question, because I'm working with UNICEF at the regional office um, in Dhaka, so I'm supporting some country office in the um, humanitarian planning process. And I, I know that in the in the region there's some issue to to make sure that um, education will be taken into account in uh, the humanitarian response. 
and sometimes it's, uh, it's quite difficult for the clusters or for the, the colleagues in the field to advocate and to push all the colleagues from the entire clusters or from OCHA or from other colleagues to to very we well understood the, the role of education and the impact of the crisis uh, on education. So that's why I ask if there are some resources that we can share with the countries, especially in the um, in this time of the uh, pro, uh, of the planning, humanitarian planning now, so it could be useful. Don't know if uh, my question is clear or if you need. Can I maybe ask? Are you are you suggest are you saying that uh, it could be a good idea for funding or resources to be specifically allocated towards advocacy in these? Um, Funding clusters is is that is that part of your idea? Yes, it could be for the funding, but not only. You know, it's just to, to be sure that in the in the planning uh, document, uh, to to ensure that uh, education will have a, a place and a good place to to advocate for the funding, but not only for funding. Maybe to to. Um, to have also more partners involved and uh, for the education response. Maybe it depends on the country, but I know it's not uh, often easy to to make understand uh, people for, from other sectors that yes, uh, education can uh, very be uh, saving life and uh, you know like life saving intervention and uh, yes, yes, yeah. you know, and, and especially in the context of the region because we are in the protracted crisis, so many people would think that uh, this is uh, like structural issues and not specifically emergency so sometimes it's not easy to yes to 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 have the narrative to explain the the the, the needs the needs in the emergency context yeah no it's a good question um would anyone from the advocacy working group have, have thoughts on that No, because I saw in the presentation that uh, there's a point on that, you know, uh, but uh, make sure that education is uh, like a priority uh, within the humanitarian response. So that's why I ask if there's some specific resources of, or for that, you know. Yeah, and I, I think from, from the perspective of INEE, um, that I'm, I've only been in it for a few months, but what I've seen is that there is a conscious effort to bring in different sectors um, to the discussions, whether it be in our media meetings or in the working groups. Um, even, for example, in two weeks' time, there'll be a meeting in Nairobi between the, um, the Education Emergencies, you know, INEE, and the Child Protection Alliance. So that's an example of education and child protection um, overlapping and discussing um, the, the priorities for both of those sectors at the same time, but I, I agree that more needs to be done to, to to spread the word of education across different sectors. As you say, is different in many different contexts. So I'd be interested to hear from people who've worked in different contexts around the world how good coordination yeah. is between education and um, and the other sectors working in a humanitarian response. Um, and also spilling over into development and um, in protracted situations, and Peter from Zabel Project has asked the question um, that um, how do we design advocacy tools that not only address education emergencies, but also children's holistic development as they may spend all their childhood in exile? I think that's a possibly a connected question. Um, interested for more thoughts on that. Perhaps I could just, uh, uh, this is Peter again from INE, uh, while you think about that question, perhaps I just go back to the, uh, to, to the other question around the cluster and about INE's role. Um, 
And, and of course, many of you probably already work in responses on the ground, very involved in cluster work. Uh, but, but anyway, you could you could view the architecture of education in emergency slightly as a triangle, where you have in one corner you have INE, which is the network and a standard set uh, uh, organization uh, trying to influence policy, trying to influence uh, 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 through advocacy, trying to build capacity. Uh, and then you have in another corner you have the cluster, which are you know the entity. You have a global cluster sitting in Geneva, and then you have actual clusters in, in many countries, 35, 40 countries, and, and they are the, the 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 responders and the and the implementers, and 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 they do a lot of capacity building also themselves, uh, especially around information management. Um, about around assessment and re response. And then the third core of that architecture is what was alluded to before, the ECW, uh, the, uh, the Education Cannot Wait Fund, and perhaps also other funds, but, but, the, but, but the Education Cannot Wait is, is very uh, 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 new and very promising, and a lot of money is committed to it uh, uh, in, the, in the last couple of uh, months. So those three in concert can perhaps try and answer some of your questions, but 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 none of them alone, you know, because you have you have the standards, you have the response, and then you have the the funding in a sense. So so when you talk about the funding, the funding comes, and right now there is an, an ongoing uh, collaboration and a project uh, uh, between the three entities, supported by ECW, uh, looking at some of these efforts here. Um, so 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 it is there. You know, it's also. Uh, uh, for those of you who perhaps do not know the the, the the cluster system, that there is a um, there is a hotline. The cluster has a hotline, and you can you can call, you can write to. Uh, um, and I encourage you to go to the education, the global education clusters website, uh, and see how uh, see how you can get support there, but also through your local clusters. Um, mm -hmm. So a, there is a lot going on there, and that capacity building aspect of 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 of, of, of continuing to make the case for for education as a life saving uh, uh, intervention. And we have to remember we've come a long way in the last ten years. You know, ten years ago we did not have that awareness of, that education should be there in the first response, uh, and that it is life saving. It is now we have so it is very embedded in OCHA thinking in in other in the UN thinking, in donor thinking, we're seeing a lot of money going to the sector now from the EU, from others, so uh, through ECW and others. So we have won a lot, lot of that argument over the last couple of years. We're not there yet. And the clusters have been on, on the forefront with, with doing that. They have beefed up their, their capacity to, to, to advocate at the country level. Uh, and, and much of that, has, some of that support has come from INE as well. I will stop here and, and let others talk to this question or the other question. Um, perhaps I can uh, chip in on the, on the question, going back to the one from um, Peter um, on the refugee, as a refugee crisis becomes more protracted, how do we design advocacy tools that not only address education and emergencies, but also children's holistic development that they may spend their childhood in exile. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think there's, to me, there's, there's two aspects of that. There's the question of the um, kind of protracted crises, um, in, particularly in refugee settings, um, and looking beyond education in emergencies. And I think that part speaks very much to uh, the, the the whole sort of debate around working at the, the nexus of humanitarian and development efforts and moving beyond um, you know human, um, uh, education emergencies and, and humanitarian efforts um, and, and moving more integrating and working alongside um, uh, longer term development efforts. Um, so within within refugee settings, um, I think the the, um, the the work around the comprehensive refugee response framework the CRRF in the countries where that is. Um, that, that has been kind of tested in, in a number of countries, but but now will be the um, the, the sort of the standard um, mode of working within uh, within refugee responses. Um, that that is a um, I mean it's you know for those of those those of you who've been kind of involved in that or um, or are following that that's it's not you know without problems, but but that sort of space and, and process to bring bring different stakeholders together to try to work on more sustainable. 
um, uh, sustainable approaches to, to managing refugee situations um, is, uh, I think, is, is an important um, kind of entry point for, for advocacy. Um, the other um, uh, the other part of that question speaks to this this question of kind of children's holistic development, um, and that's where I think it's it's uh, it's speaking to the kind of the, the more kind of multi-sectoral uh, um, uh, responses. And coming back to, I think it was uh, either Edmund or Gustavo um, mentioned the, the the ongoing and increasing work to integrate work across the education and child protection sectors that will be discussed at the um, the INE INE Alliance Roundtable next week. Um, and and that I think there, there there's some very concrete efforts towards looking at um, at bridging work across those sectors and how. Um, you know, they're obviously working with uh, the same, in many cases, the same uh, kind of target beneficiaries. Um, how can those those responses across protection and education be more uh, more integrated? So I think that there are uh, the work that I and the Alliance are, are doing to, in the in the lead up to that roundtable. There are some suggested sort of advocacy entry points for. Um, uh, for where that we can uh, we can sort of be be working on advocacy to promote more more joined up working and um, and, and as you say to be working on more kind of holistic approaches to um, to, to meeting the needs of children in crises. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from Philip from the Silk Road organisation. I worked in Syria and now in Iraq. The main challenge for us is the funds reducing for the education sector in general, and especially for the Middle East region. Today, the majority of the funding is focusing on livelihoods and forgetting education. We are hoping to find more ways, donors, or tools to support this sector. And Ellen, Ellen is going to give a response to that, or some insights on that. I'll just say a little bit and then maybe ask if there are other participants who can also uh, come in to you know looking at the strategy. I don't know others, but you, you cut out. I couldn't hear most of your response. Oh, um, am I clear now? Yes. Okay, better yet. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was saying um, uh, thanks to Philip for the question. I was, I, you know, as, as I saw that question, I quickly went back to the ECW, um, their strategic document, which they produced earlier this year. And I've actually noticed that both Syria and Iraq are on their list of the 25 countries that they are prior, that they've prioritized. Um, and so this might be something for Silk Road organization to plug into. I know that they are, um, you know, working mostly through UNICEF at the country level, um, and so it's quite important for organizations in the field to plug into that process. Um, more often than not, ECW uh, goes and has um, sort of, um, you know, they conduct uh, missions to the different countries as a way of igniting conversations with those countries. Um, and at the moment, I know that they are, you know, negotiating multi-year funding for a number of countries, including Uganda. And so I'm just wondering, Philip, whether you've been able to connect into that process, whether, you know, when you're in Syria or now in Iraq, as a way of going into in, or plugging into that particular process. But I do agree with you completely, which is why I think it's important for us to engage even more in advocacy efforts for e for education in emergencies because there is that recognition that education doesn't always find itself uh, at the top of the list particularly in such settings when it comes to funding. So um, all the more reason for us to work together to continue with our advocacy efforts. But I really um, urge you 
to, um, if you haven't done so already, uh, find out how your organization can be part of the, um, you know, process for ECW within uh, Iraq and to see how you can engage with that process. And that may, may also uh, open up um, the avenues for other opportunities as well. So maybe others on the call may want to um, say more on this. Okay, thanks, Ellen. So now's the time to ask a question. If you don't have the chat option and you have a burning question, um, I uh, will open the floor for that. And um, in case there aren't many and you're all still thinking of questions, um, something that would be good to discuss before the end of the call is to talk about which advocacy topics would interest you for coverage in future webinars. So if you can have a think about that and maybe make comments so that we can plan for the next ones. Hello. Hello. Yeah, do go ahead. Yeah. I'm Anise from Bujumbura, Burundi. I work for World Child Orange. Just to say that um, I'm uh, happy to take part of on this um, webinar in the future, and uh, uh, I say that uh, I'm agree with uh, I'm I. Uh, with, uh, with this organization or this uh, uh, webinar in the future I will be happy also to be included and invited uh, to take part of with the, the next webinar and um, our experience in, in the, our experience now we are uh, we have we are inter we are inter we have uh, our intervention is the, about protection and uh, education and uh, school social and uh, our in the future we are making uh, uh, to grow up to make different intervention with uh, uh, with the project mixing with uh, protection and education. Uh, I'm happy to be a uh, take part of with uh, uh, this group to, to participate in this webinar uh, because we are now trying to develop our intervention about uh, the minimum standards of education in emergencies. Yes. That's uh, what uh, I have to say about this uh, discussion. Question. Thank you. Thank you for the input, Aniset. Um, maybe I could ask you: Do you have any specific areas you think we should cover in the next webinar? You talked about the minimum standards. Um, is there is there something that one of the future webinars could could discuss in? relation to that that would help around advocacy? Um, ab minimum standards about education emergencies. Um, you ask me f about the first question? Sorry? Yes, um, I was just wondering whether you had ideas of what future webinar sessions could, could cover. In uh, inter uh, emergencies? Education emergencies. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Any ideas for the next webinar? Um, no. Now I have no uh, choose. Okay. Um, maybe anyone else have any thoughts on that or any other questions? I haven't now. But I would like to, to ask about the, the, the materials or resources which may be useful to the, the constituencies. I don't understand what uh, uh, 
what uh, do you mean or do you want to explain about uh, advocacy materials or resources? Yes, I think the question there is that is is asking participants of this call uh, if yeah. they have um, materials that they can use um, can can share that maybe have been successful in the past. Maybe okay. you can okay. describe them now, or even we could find a way of sharing so that people can tell stories of what they've done in the past that has been successful. Okay. Okay. It may also be that we could uh, have a discussion about which tools that we as an advocacy working group and, and you as members of INE and, and uh, in general should develop, should aim to develop. This is part of the, the work that we do and, and this, web, this webinar is the first hopefully of a series of those webinars and tools development on how to capacity build uh, advocates for education in emergencies. So it's also about not just identifying which tools are there, but also which which are needed, which are not there yet, and which ones could we as a group or as a membership organization, as a, as a larger membership, come together and develop. I'm, I'm thinking, this is Gustavo here, and I'm thinking that, um, you know, we have a few minutes late, uh, a few minutes left, and um, it would be great to hear from the audience so that this, you know, this group is as responsive uh, to the demand and, and the needs that, that we hear. Um, we all try to, in our working group, um, try to be uh, conscious of, of, of those needs and, and think of what would be most helpful for our field. Um, however, I understand that not everybody will probably have a chance or may feel compelled or, or may have a specific idea right now. And, and one idea that I'm thinking is that we might, you know, we could probably think of a survey, um, a simple survey with, you know, one or two questions just to get input from, from people as to what topics are, of, you know, sort of urgent, uh, urgent right now. Um, what are those tools that Peter was referring to and others um, earlier uh, that would be most helpful? There's a lot on online. Obviously, we you know we type advocacy. There's tools and there's toolkits and etc. Um, not always geared toward uh, education emergencies or a specific topic. Or sometimes it's hard to sort of uh, discern and, and, and find the right thing. So you know, one thing that we, we could probably discuss internally at some point based on, on today's um, you know, webinar is, is you know, how, do, how do we collect more uh, input from uh, IME members and non-members, and not, not uh, but users and, and um, those who need to do advocacy in this field. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that, you know, you, you know we'll discuss it internally and, and if we decide to, to move forward, um, one way to distribute those types of things is via social media on INE's website. So my recommendation is that you follow INE on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook um, and that you sign up for INE's newsletters as well. Um, because if we move forward with some survey or uh, announcing other events or activities, that will be a, a good way for you to, to be engaged. Thanks, Gustavo. I think that sounds like a good idea. I'd be interested to hear other participants if what you think of that idea of the survey and um, would that be something that would be useful for you? Okay, um, 
So if there's if there um, aren't any other questions, um, if there, you happen to have a question, um, you can still type. We still have a few more minutes. I might ask a question to Ellen and Alison. Um, Alison gave a bit of a taster on a possible topic for future webinar on um, the range of tactics and, and mediums. Alison, would you be able to, to to go into a little bit more detail, of, you know, in one minute, as to what that the types of things might be in a webinar that covered that topic? Oh goodness! Now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> this is a webinar we haven't planned for yet. I mean, if if it is there, I mean, the, I suppose that the next sort of step, um, I would I would assume in terms of sort of taking the series forward, as you say, would be more looking at the kind of the how to, of um, uh, of, of sort of how to approach advocacy. So um, I think that we could we could certainly look to shape a webinar around different uh, different tools and tactics. Um, I think it, what would be useful is to understand from the participants and maybe through the surveys you proposed um, the kind of the levels that they're working at, um, and uh, and and so we can we can really sort of tailor it to um, to the the needs of the participants um, because you know there's no point in spending a lot of time talking about uh, tools and tactics that we use at uh, in the UN and uh, with the UN and in Geneva if, uh, if if that's not relevant to participants. So it would be very it would be good if we could shape that. Um, uh, in response to uh, to survey questions, but it would also be good to use, I think, some some concrete examples. Um, and I know that you sort of requested this from from participants, but but maybe we can do some work, kind of sourcing those, um, and really kind of unpack different examples of where advocacy has worked, where it hasn't worked, where are the what are the lessons learned, and some of the limitations, and so that we can make this a bit more concrete um, for uh, for participants in future webinars. Thanks, Alison. Yes, you did. You did well under pressure there. But I think the the point that um, we're getting from from this is that there's still a lot more to be discussed, and this um, feels very much like an introduction, um, an introduction that could lead to many more conversations, sharing of resources, ideas, um, and information data um, from very varied organisations, individuals, people working in contexts all over the world. And um, I think that can only be a good thing. So I would encourage all of you who have participated today um, to, to stay in touch, watch out for future events like this, and also to, to thank you for, for spending an hour and a half um, on this topic with us today. Um, and to thank the presenters uh, for, their, for their great presentation. Um, we're coming to the end of, of the session now. Uh, any last minute comments um, before we log off? Um, but for me, just to say thanks for everyone for participating. Yeah, yes, Edmund. I just wanted to say that I think as an advocacy working group, we are also looking forward to really playing that uh, convener role where we can, as you know, Alison and other colleagues have said, really be the ones creating the platform, but giving an uh, giving an opportunity to the membership um, to you know present their work, share some of their results, uh, talk about the challenges, you know, troubleshooting, um, inviting others um, who are in the same regions to you know work together on joint advocacy efforts. So, you know, we're hoping that the webinar series won't be, you know, a lot of us, you know, doing the presentations, but also opportunities for the membership to come in and use this space um, to connect their advocacy efforts, but also get uh, useful advice and tips and, you know, other learning opportunities on how we can work together on um, advocacy for education in emergencies. So looking forward to working together and to um, really take effective use um, and, uh, of, of this opportunity of this webinar series. Thanks. So I, I would just like to take the opportunity as well uh, from INE to say thank you for your participation here. It's been fantastic. So uh, over to Edmund. But did you say over to Edmund? 
Um, I did. If, if, okay, if so, um, that's it for today. And um, thank you all again. We'll look forward to being in touch and talking with you all again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.